Daphne. Where are you? Ma'am, is everything okay? It's my husband. He, he's disappeared. Honey, have you seen the kids? Mm. Mm, I'm sick. Where are they? Where, where are my kids? My grandparents, I can't find them. They were sitting right here. Ray. Boy, that was perfect timing, huh? Ray, people are missing. Dozens of seats, empty. Patty, it's a big airplane. People are probably in the lab. I'm done. Driver, there's, there's, there's no driver in there. There, there. I don't know, but it's everywhere. Say again? Guardia, Morley, lost air traffic controllers, missing flight crews, planes down all over. Maybe the common factor isn't in those who were taken. Maybe it's in those who were left behind. Hey, are you okay? this program to bring you a special report. seen that series and so on. It's, it's been around a long time now. Uh, I shared uh, last time we were together uh, in, the, in the fall, uh, my left behind story. See, I, was, uh, I came to know the Lord as a, as a middle teen, uh, 15 years old, and one of the first things I remember us doing in the youth group was watching the original movie Left Behind. Well, that scared the snot out of me. And so we were kind of familiar with at least, uh, you know, the Bible teaching on that. And one day I came home and uh, I was just at a friend's house during the day goofing around and, and, and having fun and came home and the house was wide open. Everything was on. Uh, the TV was going, I think there was even something on the stove, but the house was empty. And I was freaked. And I'm like, Mom, you know how you come in the house, Mom? Because 
My mom worked at home. And uh, so no answer, looked around. It looked like everybody should be there, but no one was there. And it turned out that my youngest brother, Matt, who's now Dr. Matt, had uh, done one of the crazy things he always did. Uh, be, you know, one time he lit himself on fire. I don't know. So, so instead of calling him Matt Powell, we called him Match Powell. But, but nonetheless, one of those crazy things happened that, that my mom had to sweep him up and, and rush him into the doctor and everything was just left. But that left me thinking I'd been left behind. And so that, that was my left behind moment. Maybe you've had a left behind moment. We don't know exactly what that event is going to look like. The Lord doesn't tell us exactly what it's going to look like. But we know it's going to happen. We don't even know when it's going to happen. But we know it's going to happen. You say, well, how can that happen? You know, the Bible records other events of this nature taking place. Did you know that Enoch walked with God and then he was no more? Did you know that Elijah was the prophet of God and Elisha was his understudy? And Elijah was caught up. And the only thing left behind was his prayer shawl that came floating, fluttering down and fell on Elisha, his apprentice, his understudy for prophet. So God has proven according to the biblical record, that he can and does do this. Shouldn't come as a surprise to us that it's going to happen. Now, God may be able, we know he is, to do this in a much more orderly way than we just saw on the clip, or he may not choose to do it that way. But he's going to do it. Now, today is not technically a prophetic message. It's more about where each of us stands in light of prophetic truth. That's what today really is. See, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 3, people have always been a little concerned about whether they were left behind. Uh, it says there, and you'll see on the slide, we request you, brethren, this is Paul writing to the Thessalonian church, uh, with regard to the coming of our Lord and our gathering together in him, that you not be quickly shaken or disturbed that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one, I've left out some things that doesn't change the meaning to shorten this up a little bit. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Now, here's what you need to understand about this passage. It's talking about two separate events right at the beginning. And the two separate events are, are emboldened there. Uh, the coming of our Lord, right? And the other event is our gathering together in him. Now, we don't know the things that will precede our gathering together in him, but it tells us uh, that the first thing that has to take place at the end of this little clip of verses that I give you it says the first thing that has to happen is the great apostasy has to happen. And then the man of lawlessness is revealed. We know who that is. The Bible calls him the Antichrist. So there are these two acts in the real life drama of Jesus' return that are named here in this passage. He will be coming in the clouds to get those that are his. Now, the passage that spells this out very clearly, and there are a number of them, John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, talks about Jesus coming back for us. So, but here in this, in this passage, you can turn in your Bibles or on your devices or whatever. I'm just going to kind of read a few highlights in this passage from 1 Thessalonians 4. But we don't want you to be uninformed or ignorant, brethren. This is Paul writing also. About those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as those who have no hope. Now, he's talking about those who have died as believers in Christ doesn't want us to grieve as hopeless grieves, in hopeless grief. And then, and then he says in verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we do as believers, if we believe that, uh, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. So he's going to bring them with him to what now? For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that means that Paul received this directly from Jesus' own mouth because he was taught by Jesus. This was not a Holy Spirit revealed truth. 
This was a Jesus revealed to Paul truth. That's what he means by that. Uh, we, we received from the Lord that we who are alive and remain, that means we haven't yet died as believers. The we means believers. Until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who fell asleep as believers. Okay, remember, Jesus is bringing them with him. They died before. Their human bodies are on earth. They have a temporary heavenly body, a spiritual body that he brings them with them and their bodies are going to be resurrected. And then, and then those who are alive and remain, when he does that, are going to be caught up together with them. Caught up. That's the catching away. And that's what we call the rapture because the Latin word for being caught up is, lap, is rapturos. That's where that word comes from. So if you look in your Bible and say, well, I rapture, 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 you look it up on your device, rapture. It's not in the Bible. That's a Latin word that theologians use to describe this true biblical event of being caught up. Just like Enoch, just like Elijah, just like Jesus, caught up out of their sight. We know God can do it, and he says he's going to do it. Okay, so, uh, so that's kind of laying those parameters down. Now, the, the, the other event that it mentions is Jesus returning when he's coming back. That event is talked about in Revelation 19. Now, again, this is rather lengthy, so if you're there, you can look it up or make a note of it. In Revelation 19, uh, verse 7, this is talking about the church now with the Lord Jesus. It says, let's rejoice and be glad and give glory to him because the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Who is his bride? The church. All believers of every stripe, of every generation, of, of every year, uh, make up the church. Okay. Today here, all of those who are here who know and love Jesus are the visible church. But the church is much larger than us here. Okay. The true universal church is made up of all of those who for all time have trusted in Christ. Okay. Some have fallen asleep, died in Christ. Some are around the world alive in Christ. All of that is the church, and the Bible calls his church his bride. Okay? It was given to her, who? His bride. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, because the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints, believers. Okay? Now, uh, he says, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said, these, these words are true, words of God. Now, skipping down, remember the description of the, the bride here. He says, and I saw heaven open. This is verse 11. And behold, a white horse and he who sat upon it called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and wages war. And his eyes are a flame of fire. And upon his head are many diadems. And he has written upon him a name which no one knows except himself. And he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. That's Jesus, the Word. He's, he's the expression of the Godhead. He always was. He came as the person of Jesus, but he existed before and he exists today. Okay? And so uh, it says, and the armies which are in heaven, listen to this now, the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. Now, let me back up to what we just read before. And the church was clothed in fine linen, bright, uh, bright and clean. Uh, and the fine linen are the righteous acts of the saints. Skipping back down to what we just read, those following him on white horses uh, were clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Do you see a similarity here? It's the church coming back with him when he comes to earth. Okay, That's all of those who belong to him. All of those who believe and trust in him. That's the church coming back with him because they were with him in heaven when he's coming back. Why? Because they were caught up. <laughs> you can't come back unless you're there, right? You can't do it. So I wanted to share those things with you to say we have two events here. They're clearly biblical events and uh, kind of important. And then he kind of gives us the things that have to happen uh, before this takes place. Now, the first thing, and it says in our passage in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the first thing that has to take place is the apostasy. Some of your Bibles or devices might say the great falling away. And the reason it would say that is because the 
word used in the Bible in the Greek is translated apostasy, and a lot of people don't know what that means, so translators define the word rather than just translate it. And so uh, it says there will be a great apostasy. That comes from the Greek word apostasia, which is made up of two parts of a word. It's a compound word, and you see it on your slide. Apo, which means away from, and hestemi, which means to stand. In other words, to, to come away from standing. In other words, to turn away from Christ, to rebel against Christ, uh, to abandon Christ, to defect. An apostate is a person who, who seemed to, they found me, they come in. I thought I could hide in here with you guys, but they, they found me. Uh, an apostate is a person who seemed to know Christ, attended church, identified with the body of Christ, gathered, served in the church, did all those things, maybe gave a lot of money, did a lot of things, but weren't really truly believers and left. Maybe it got hard. Maybe things didn't go the way they thought. Maybe they got ill and you know they thought God betrayed them and, then, and they turned away. Now, don't make the mistake of thinking that, that you can determine who does this by appearance. Because the outside can be very deceptive of people. There could be people who seem not to know Christ, but they're actually on the run, and they do know Christ. Remember, Jonah did that. You know, and a lot of examples of that. So don't be deceived by outward appearances. There are also those who appear to be believers, but they actually aren't. Did you know that there are actually people who, who think they are true believers and actually aren't? The Bible tells us that that's true. My brother, Brad, I shared last week about how he was the troublemaker of the bunch. And, you know, he, he, he just went really down, got involved in drugs. And, uh, you know, okay, so the drug culture back in the 70s, in the early 70s, uh, was a little different than today, but nonetheless, he did. And uh, he was in full uh, rebellion. But one my dad forced him to go to the Bill Gothard Seminary in Detroit. Forced him to go. Said, you're going or you're out of the house. Okay, I'll go. <laughs> Got down to Cobo Hall, which no longer exists. Found the highest seat in the furthest place, way up, nosebleed section of Cobo Hall, thinking he could somehow escape sitting up there. But you see, God knows that seat too. And uh, found him there and right there he came to truly know Christ and until he came to truly know Christ and surrender to him he didn't know that he didn't really know Christ thought he did thought he knew everything there was to know about Christ and found it lacking and wanting why because he didn't really know Christ it never went from the outside to the inside it was always just something he kind of play acted put on, thought he was doing it, didn't know there was actually more to it. So uh, there are many people like that, and, and some are going to be very surprised, surprised and shocked. Remember, in Matthew 7, Jesus warns, many will say to me in that day, wait a minute, didn't we serve you? Didn't we do this? He said, and he said, but I'll say to them, depart from me because I never knew you. He's not going to say, I, I once knew you, but now I don't. What he's going to tell them is, I never knew you. So why am I saying all these things? I'm saying this because, an, because in order for there to be a great falling away, a great apostasy, there has to be a great false church because the real church isn't going to fall away. Real believers who have Christ living in them by the Holy Spirit cannot leave. You say, what do you mean they can't leave? God's not going to let you leave. Once you belong to him, once his spirit indwells you, he's not going out and he's not letting you leave. Now, you might not like that, but that's biblically true. Now, the Bible says that there are those who persist in their rebellious walk and God actually takes them home rather than let them fall away. Okay, that's the warning, isn't it? In, in 1 Corinthians 11, as we gather to... to 
celebrate the Lord's Supper and we're supposed to, you know, judge ourselves and, and, you know, evaluate ourselves in Christ and so on. It says, because there are those who, who don't do that. And it says, some of them are sick and others have fallen asleep. There's that word again, because God's just not letting go of you. See, no one can pluck us out of his hand and, that's, and that goes for you too. I can't even pluck myself out of God's hand. He's not letting me do it. So, so therefore, in order for there to be a great apostasy, as the Bible says, there has to be a great body of individuals who appear to be Christians, but actually aren't. And they fall away, they turn away. You know, when the, when the temperature starts getting turned up, they say, That's, forget this stuff. It's too costly. It costs too much to continue identifying with Christ. And they reveal themselves finally, a great falling away. That's that thing that it's talking about that has to take place. So uh, there are two things I think. Number one, I think that we've been building this false church for a long time. We've been building this vast false body because we're not telling people the truth of what it really means to have Christ in you, as the Bible says, the hope of glory. What it really means to belong to him, to have surrendered all to him, for him to be the king of your life. You know the hymn, king of my life, I crown thee now. Rather than just identifying with a point of view, identifying with a body, a community of nice people like y'all. It's way more than that. And that is really what our message is about today. You see, how can we avoid being left behind? Don't be left behind, instead be born again. And that's the difference. And so what we're gonna be looking at is how we can know and avoid being left behind. As the Bible says, many will be who think they won't be. Now, we didn't see the whole movie, we just saw a little clip in that thing, but in that movie, they rightly bring out people in the church, even a pastor in the church who got left behind, who's on the floor weeping and wailing and crying, what, how could this be? How? Because he got left behind. Because for him it was more a show. And no one knew it, no one could know, because the outside can be deceiving. So in the Gospel of John, or I'm sorry, just before we get, get there, uh, the Bible, tells us repeatedly, and in this spot, it's very clear, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, it says, so test yourselves. Test yourselves, examine yourselves to see if you are in the faith. And then it gives us the one single answer to the test. This is pretty important, so I'm just gonna read it to you so you say, well, I don't, that's not in there. Oh yeah, absolutely, it's there. In 2 Corinthians 13, here's what, uh, here's what, this is Paul speaking again. It says this, test yourselves to see if you're in the faith, examine yourselves, or do you not know, or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test. See, if you fail the test, he's not in you, but a true believer has Christ in them. In other words, something has changed and changed places where the Lord Jesus, by his Holy Spirit, was outside, now he's inside. Where before I was empty and devoid of that, now I'm filled with that. You see, that's, that's true biblical Christianity. Natural born people, are born without the Spirit of God in them, and we are born dead spiritually. Why? Because that's what we inherited from our forefather, Adam. Remember, God promised, if in the day you eat of the fruit thereof, you will surely die. Satan lied and said, oh, you won't really die. He was splitting hairs as he always does. You're not gonna drop dead physically, you're gonna be sin. And there they were standing there after they'd eaten of the fruit. Sure enough, they didn't die physically. But do you think that God wasn't telling the truth? 
in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. They did die. Well, then what died? They lost the Spirit of God. He fled away. They died spiritually. And from that moment on, the entire human race, including you and I, were born dead spiritually, meaning without the Spirit of God in us. Now, the only thing that can save us is to somehow get the Spirit of God back inside, be filled with Him. That is what it is to be a believer, to surrender to Him, believe and trust from the heart, and He says, and I will come into Him, right? And sup with Him, and He with me, Revelation 3.20. So, uh, so that's the story of the human race. It's your story and it's my story. We were all born dead. Did you know that God created mankind as a trichotomous being? That means three parts. Body, soul, and spirit. He breathed, his, he breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life and he became a living soul. But in the day that he ate of the fruit, he died and went from being a trichotomous being, three parts, to being a dichotomous being, two parts. I know this is pretty deep. Simple math. Body and soul, still an, still an eternal being, but lacking the Spirit of God. This is the good part. When a person truly comes to trust Christ, they don't just identify with a group of people, they are transformed into a trichotomous being again because they receive God's Spirit in them and they are body, soul, and the Spirit of God. Never more to die. That's biblical Christianity, you see. What an amazing story. So you say, well, wait a minute, how could we miss this? Look, the Gospel of John is the Gospel of belief, and it sets up the story of Nicodemus, who was a religious leader of Israel, knew the Bible forward and backwards, that would be the Old Testament, and the Lord Jesus came on the scene, and he was doing all of these crazy things, including coming and clearing out the temple and throwing over the tables and so on. And Nicodemus came to Jesus at night to ask him about these things. So if you want to get to know God, get to know Jesus. If you want to get to know Jesus, go to the Gospels. Uh, and so... In the Gospel of John, we're kind of getting to know the Lord Jesus a little better. And this is an amazing thing, because you thought that you understood this amazing message. But I'm telling you, there's way more than you thought to this simple little message, it seems. You see, the Gospel of John was written by the Holy Spirit through John. He was one of the sons of Zebedee, brother of James. There were James and John. They were the sons of Zebedee, and Jesus called them the sons of thunder. One of their cohorts, Peter, uh, they were the three of the apostles that seemed to be with Jesus the most, Peter, James, and John. They were the three Jesus took on the Mount of Transfiguration when he was, his, his flesh was pulled back and they saw his, his deity shining forth, the brilliance of his deity. That's called the transfiguration. Those three, Peter, James, and John, got to see that. Well, uh, so John is, is the one that, that God used to write this gospel. And uh, this gospel <clears throat> doesn't claim to be an exhaustive record of the life of Jesus. It claims to record the necessary miracles of Jesus. Uh, why? John chapter 20, 31, so that you might believe and that believing you might have life in his name. Everything that was recorded was for the purpose of people believing in the Lord Jesus. It was all centered around this amazing thing. And that's why, uh, as you see in the, in the verse John 20 and 30, 31. Now, I once knew an a, a amazingly practical and wise pastor. And that, that wise and practical pastor once said 50 years ago, it's profoundly simple, but simply profound. And that's the guy that said it right there. And I was sitting in this room. 
This is profoundly simple, but simply profound. And that's why John 3.16 seems to be the first verse that anyone ever memorizes. Because it's very simple. And it is, and it ought to be. But beneath it is a simply profound message, isn't it? That God has, and that so many miss it in the, in the midst of the simplicity. And so that's what we're going to look at. And, and I know that many of you here do, in fact, know and trust Jesus and love him with your whole heart. But hopefully this will give you some things that you can use to tell others. That the truth of the message is, because I, I fear that many are missing it. I think a lot of young people are, are hearing the simplicity in the surface message and not understanding the real truth about what it is to come and know the Lord Jesus and have him as Savior and be made alive, literally brought back to life, resurrected to life in Jesus, uh, which everyone in him is. So Jesus was doing the miracle at Cana and clearing the table and the signs, and uh, Nicodemus came to him. He was a ruler in Israel. He said to Jesus, we know that you are from God, he goes on to say, because no one can do the things that you do except they're from God. They knew that Jesus was from God which is an indictment on all the rest of the Pharisees who wanted to kill him anyway. Think about that. That's, that's crazy. He said, you're a teacher sent by God, and God is with you. So Nicodemus asked some questions of Jesus, which we don't have recorded in the Gospel. But we know, we know the questions that he must have asked based on Jesus' answer. And so here are the kind of questions that Nicodemus was asking Jesus. Can I see God's kingdom? How can I enter God's kingdom? How can I go to heaven? Had to be something along those lines. Why? You say, how do you know, Cliff? Well, because that's what Jesus answered. How he could see God, how he could see the kingdom, how he could go to heaven. So we know that's the kind of thing that Nicodemus was asking Jesus. And, and so Jesus' answer uh, he said, in order to see the kingdom, in order to enter the kingdom or go to heaven, you must be born physically and spiritually. Jesus is laying out what we just got done talking about here in John 3. It's one of the greatest passages in the entire Bible. Not just John 3.16, because this is, all, this is all leading up to John 3.16. You know, John 3.16 was part of what Jesus told Nicodemus. Here's this incredibly well-educated, incredibly powerful leader in Israel, in ancient Israel. And Jesus is sharing John 3.16 with him. But he's not stopping at the surface. He's telling him the truth about it. And so he says in verse 3, Jesus answered, Nicodemus said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, which means anyone, unless anyone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That means Nicodemus must ask, how can I see the kingdom? How can I go to heaven? And then Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he's old? He can't enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? You think about this dignified leader, well-educated doctorate of doctorates in Israel law and the Old Testament saying, you mean to say I could enter my mom's womb again and be born again all over again? He'd never heard of anything like that at all. So here he is being made to be like a little child at the foot of Jesus, learning the simply profound truth about the simple gospel. And so Jesus goes on. He says, so truly, truly, I say, unless one is born of water, that's physical birth. How many of you have kids? How many of you ladies have given birth to kids? Was there some water involved there? I think so. I think it involves some water, some breaking of the water. It's like, okay, unless a person is born of water, and which is in a larger sense born into this world, which is of water and made of water, okay, and the spirit, water, physical birth into this world, and the spirit, spiritual birth into the kingdom, and unless a person is born of both of those, not just one and pretending the other, but both, uh, you cannot see the kingdom of God. In other words, he's telling the Gideon, okay, the, the only way this can happen is you gotta be born twice. 
You know, there's an old saying that the old preachers used to say, better to be born twice and die once than to be born once and die twice. Write that down. <laughs> okay. So then the Lord continues. That which is born of flesh is flesh. Okay, you're born in this world, born of water to born of flesh. It's flesh. That's all, it is. That's all you got. Yeah, mortal, because that's how we were designed, but not, not born in the spirit. But that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So don't marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. See, he just explained it to you. Now, don't, don't marvel at this, Nicodemus. This is how it works. What I just told you before is what Jesus just said to Nicodemus. The, and now he's describing the spirit and how it works. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it's coming from and where it's going. He's using the wind to describe the Holy Spirit, whose name is the pneumos, which means the breath of God, the spirit of God, okay? And he says, so is everyone who's born of the spirit. You don't know where it's coming from and where it's going, but you see the effects of the Holy Spirit on the life. You can't see the spirit floating. You can't see the spirit going in, and, but but you see the impact and the effects of a person born of the Spirit. It's undeniable. It's undeniable. And so Nicodemus is sitting there. You can almost picture this guy just stunned. And the, the scripture in verse 9 says, Nicodemus said to him, how can this be? I think he was saying, how could I not know this? How could this be? All the things he heard and so on, he's like, just the head exploding moment. How is this possible? How can this be? So, uh, so the Lord Jesus sharing something profoundly simple, but simply profound with Nicodemus. It's like the Lord Jesus was telling Nicodemus, Nicodemus, it's not really about the washings. Those were outward, outward signs. It's not about the sacrifice of Passover. It's about the true and final sacrifice. It's really what Jesus is communicating to Nicodemus. Uh, it's not about the intricacies of the law and their traditions, Nicodemus. It's about the Lord of the law. So Nicodemus is getting schooled here. He's getting a whole new education, things that he had never even, never remotely thought of before. Uh, Nicodemus knew a lot about God, but he didn't know God whom the Bible says to know is eternal life, to truly know. John 17, verse three, by the way. So let me illustrate that for you. I, I really don't know much about art. I mean, I'm talking about fine art, people. I wouldn't know it, but there are people that know a lot about art. And they go to galleries and so on. I, I, just, I look at it, I say, that's, yeah, it's painting. But there are people that know this stuff they can take a painting and they can, they can look at it and tell you from the brush strokes who painted that painting, which one of the greats painted it. And they, they know all about you know, the great artists and they can go on and on about them. But would it be true if they said that they actually personally know the artist? No, that wouldn't be true. They know a lot about the artists and their work, but they don't actually know the artist. The artist is dead and gone. And there are a lot of people that know a lot about God. I've talked with professors, years and years long pastors who know a lot about God, a lot about God's word, and a lot about the things God's done in all of his creation and the beauty of it. But that doesn't mean they know God. Two different things. There are people that think that if they spend a lot of time in nature, they'll get to know God. No, they'll get to know the amazing works of God. But there's only one way to know God, and that's through Jesus, his son. Just the one way, that's all. And that's how people get deceived into thinking that they're okay. I cannot tell you how many of my relatives I talked with about the Lord and how important it is that all of us 
recognize that we're not alive spiritually and the only way to get alive spiritually is to put trust and faith in Christ. Oh, I'm okay, you know, I'm, I'm fine, it's gonna be fine. No, no, you don't understand. None of us is okay without Jesus. I'm, I'm gonna be fine. And as far as I know, and it's not my place to know 100%, they left this life without him and they're not okay because no one is. No one is, none of us are. So, <clears throat> moving on with this amazingly simple but simply profound message. You like that? Yeah, yeah I know the guy that said that. Good friend of mine. Forget for a moment everything you've ever heard and learned and thought about God and knowing him. It's not doing church, although the Lord wants you to. It's not religion, it's not being a Christian. It's coming to the true knowledge of Christ, as is put in 2 Peter chapter 1, through the true knowledge of Christ. Now, if there's a true knowledge of Christ, what does that mean to you? There must be a false knowledge. And there is. The wicked one has planted it over and over and over again. There are thousands of those false knowledge religions and cults and things in this world blinding people to the truth of Jesus. And uh, that's a false knowledge. It's not doing something or trying to be something, but containing someone. That's the quote of another guy I know. It's not so much trying to be something, but rather contain someone. No one can change their own heart. Can the leopard change its spots? That was a prophetic message from the Old Testament, that no one can do this to themselves. You can't make yourself alive in Jesus. You can, through a lot of work and effort and discipline, make yourself a better person and a more noble person. Parents discipline and so on, and what parent wouldn't do that? That's the right thing to do. But Christian mom and dad, you cannot discipline your children into Christ. Only the gospel by the Holy Spirit can do that. Now, giving them the scriptures at a young age to make them wise unto salvation, which is in Christ, is a good thing to do. But they too must come to Jesus. The people that you talk to, your sons and daughters, about their children, they must also come. There's only one way. So uh, it's not being close with friends who do know Jesus. That, that's not going to help you either. It's not being married to someone who's faithful in Jesus. That's not going to help you either. It's not uh, being the child of someone who is faithful in Jesus. It's not even being the son or daughter of a pastor or a missionary or anyone like that. Everyone must personally be raised up and given the life in Christ by the Holy Spirit. Remember, we are fundamentally uh, deficient when we're born. We just don't have the Spirit of God in us when we're born. We don't. No one does. Now, children are covered because Jesus' death on the cross covered sin. And it covers their sin. But here's the problem. Because they don't have the Spirit of God in them, the minute they reach the age of reason, they're going to sin. You did. I did. They're going to. And they're going to be accountable for their sin. See, the Bible says where there's no, where there's no law, sin is not accounted to, uh, it, you know, their, their account. So it's not imputed to them. But once they understand, they are going to sin because we are all born in sin. They're going to. And so they're covered until they reach the age of reason, but they, but they need to have that personal encounter with the living God and be raised spiritually. Now that's a bit of a theology lesson for you, but that's how it works. So the little babies, Jesus wasn't lying when he said, to such as these belongs the kingdom of heaven. But when they get older, <laughs> they're going to sin. Uh, and then they're going to be accountable. So uh, anyway, continuing on. 
the Lord Jesus gives Nicodemus an illustration very quickly about being born again. You realize that uh, John 3.16 is really just an explanation of what came before it. You notice how John 3.16 starts with four, F-O-R, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Anytime you see the word for at the beginning of a verse, you know that what you're getting is more information or explanation of what came before it. You know, you've heard it said, wherever you see therefore, you look back to see what it's there for. Okay, well, therefore is a concluding statement, making a conclusion based on what came before it. The word for is saying, here's more information about what I just, was just telling you. So let's go back and see what John 3.16 is actually giving us more explanation about. Verse 14 says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, Jesus knew that Nicodemus would know this. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes may in him have eternal life. This story is from Numbers chapter 21. I don't know, verse 6 through 9 in that area. Numbers 21. It's the story of, of Israel who were, they were in the wilderness and they began to complain and murmur and grumble against God because of everything that they didn't have anymore. They had the Lord, but they didn't have all this other stuff that they were used to in Egypt, which wasn't as good as they pretended it was. <laughs> they were slaves, come on. They, they thought, oh, we had it so good and you brought us out here to die. Don't, they didn't have it good. They were slaves, but you know, they embellished. So the Lord Jesus is talking about this thing that happened. They were grumbling and complaining against God. And so God said, okay, fine. I'm gonna send poison snakes into the camp. The poisonous apps came to the asps, he calls them asps, I don't know why. They came into the camp and when they bit a person, dead. See, there was no like emergency trauma center down the road and they had no anti-venom. So the people were being bitten by the, th they were dying by the thousands. And they began to cry out to the Lord and cry out to Moses, go to the Lord on our behalf and plead. And so Moses did and God said, okay, Moses, here's what you want to do. I want you to mold out of brass the form of a serpent and put it on a pole in the middle of the camp. Can anybody think of a symbol like that? You know, when you walk in the hospital or see an ambulance going down the road, what's on the side? A serpent on a pole. Think about it. That's where it's from. So God said, Moses, put it in the middle of the camp and it shall be. Anyone who is bitten by a poisonous snake and looks to the serpent on the pole will not die. Simple as that. Oh, you mean just, just, just looking to the serpent on the pole to be healed, to be made alive. That's right. That's what the story is. You see, what if they stood around and said, well, that's stupid, I'm not, I got bit by that snake. Well, look at the serpent on the pole. No, that's dumb, that's not gonna make any difference. How can anybody just look at a serpent on the pole and, and be healed and not die? That's, I'm, not, I'm more intelligent than that. I'm not gonna do it, and they die. But people say the same thing about looking to Jesus. Well, that's stupid, why do you look to Jesus? I'm like, I'm fine. I can't even tell you the number of people that have said to me, I'm fine. No one's fine. None of us is fine. And so the next verse, after that story, Jesus said, for, here's more information, Nicodemus, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He was on the pole. That whoever believes in him, and that word means trusts in, has faith in, or believes in. It's the same Greek word translated all three ways. Is that right, Pastor? Yes, sir. So, pistuo. Trust in, believes in, faith in. Him will not perish but have eternal life. There it is, Nicodemus. Profoundly simple and simply profound. 
an amazing thing. Look at the back of your worship folder. It has a story about God's amazing grace on there, in case you're interested. A song. So this is what Jesus gave to one of the most intelligent, learned men in Israel who came to see him that night. You must be born again, Nicodemus, and the same answer is for every one of us. Every reasoning person in the world without personal belief, trust, or dependence on Jesus, who's God's only provision, is not going to be condemned, is already condemned. They just haven't escaped their condemnation. And the only way to escape that condemnation is in Jesus. It's the only one. Now you'll see on your slides that, so in other words, to, to not decide is to decide. Remember that. To not decide is to decide. Simple little pictures on your screen there of how sin is in the chasm. Uh, the, you know, the slew of despond that separates us from God himself. But you see, the cross is the only thing that can truly bridge that chasm and where we can meet with the Lord Jesus Christ. And there, truly come to know his new life and his embrace, the final picture that you have on your screen, which then says it's profoundly simple and it's simply profound. You might have true faith and knowledge of Christ, but you can make a difference in a person's life like Nicodemus and say, you know, all of these other things are, are issues and problems in your life, but the one thing you need that will solve it all is you need to be made alive because you're not. Because no one's alive spiritually until they come to Christ and are born again. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for this. I pray that there might be one who finally sees the truth, or Lord, there might be those in our lives who desperately need to know this truth, this simple yet profound truth about life in you. Help us to be your instruments in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening. If you would like to support Community Bible Church, we would appreciate your prayers and gifts. 
We can be reached at Community Bible Church, 1888 Crescent Lake Road, Waterford, Michigan, 48327, or at our website, www.cbcmi.com. We'd appreciate your gifts. We know that many can't give right now. So if you would, you'd be a great blessing to your brothers and sisters. God bless you. Have a great day.